Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a technical writer at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series entitled CRISPR-Cas9 Engineered 3D Tissue Culture Models of Drug-Resistant Melanoma, presented by Dr. Elizabeth Gillis. Dr. Gillis is a scientist at ATCC Cell Systems. In this presentation, Dr. Gillis will describe how CRISPR genome editing technology was used to introduce specific point mutations that confer drug resistance into A375 melanoma cells to create a BRAF and MEK1 inhibitor resistant isogenic cell line. She then demonstrates how the cell line was used in 2D culture and 3D spheroid experiments, illustrating how it can be used for drug discovery. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. Any remaining questions, as well as the recorded webinar presentation, will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Gillis. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Um, hello, this is Elizabeth Gillis, and I'm a scientist with ATCC Cell Biology. I work with ATCC's CRISPR-Cas9 engineered isogenic cell lines, and today I'm going to be talking to you about our CRISPR-Cas9 engineered 3D tissue culture models of drug-resistant melanoma. Okay, but quick a first overview of our organization. We were founded in 1925. ATCC is a nonprofit organization with headquarters in Manassas, Virginia, and an R&D services center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, we're the world's premier biological materials resource and standards development organization with over 4,000 cell lines and 70,000 microbial lines available. ATCC collaborates with and supports the scientific community with industry standard and innovative biological solutions. We have a growing portfolio of products and services, and we have sales and distribution in over 140 co countries. Uh, on top of that, we have a talented team of more than 475 employees, over one-third of which hold advanced degrees. Okay, so this webinar has three parts. First, I'm going to be talking about CRISPR-Cas9 itself and how it can be used for precision, precision genome engineering of new cell-based models for drug discovery. In the second part of the webinar, I'm going to be talking about our engineered drug-resistant melanoma model, A375 cell lines, and how we ensure that these new isogenic lines meet ATCC's high standards for quality and reproducibility. I'll also go over functional validation of these drug-resistant melanoma models in 2D tissue culture in this portion of the talk. Then in the final section of the webinar, I'll talk about the advantages of 2D versus 3D tissue culture models of disease and how these melanoma model cell lines can be used in a 3D tissue culture format. This last section will cover functional validation of the drug-resistant phenotype in our A375 melanoma models in 3D tissue culture and the system we've set up for automated screening of 3D spheroid drug response. And this first section of the webinar covers the basic the basics of precision genome editing with CRISPR-Cas9, the applications of CRISPR-Cas9 in drug discovery, and the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing platform we have set up here at ATCC. Then we'll go over the available types of cell-based models of acquired drug resistance, BRAF mutation to melanoma specifically, and the mechanisms of acquired BRAF inhibitor resistance in melanoma. Okay, so this is just a basic introduction to CRISPR-Cas9 and how it works. Um, this is a revolutionary new genome editing technology. It was developed in 2013, which means that we've only had CRISPR as a genome editing tool for about five years now, but already it's had a huge impact on the way we do genetic engineering in every system, from bacteria to plants to animals to human cells in a dish, um, so much so that it's actually very difficult to overstate how big of a deal this is. Just as a snapshot, in the last five years, there have been over 10,000 peer-reviewed articles using or discussing CRISPR-Cas9 genome engineering deposited into the PubMed database. But what does that mean for us? Uh, essentially, CRISPR-Cas9 has dramatically reduced the time, cost, and difficulty of doing gene knockouts, 
knock-ins, deletions, insertions, truncations, genomic rearrangements, or basically any other type of genetic manipulation you can want to do in a mammalian cell system. This means it's now both feasible and cost-effective to develop human cell lines as gene-engineered disease model systems. Prior to CRISPR genome engineering, the easiest way to make a genetically engineered disease model cell line would usually have been to make a knockout or a knock-in mouse with the, gene with the desired genotype, then isolate a cell line from that mouse. And if you've ever done this yourself or worked with anyone who has, you know just how time-consuming, labor, and cost-intensive this can be. Now with CRISPR-Cas9, we can just take our cell line of interest and directly edit the genome to the target cell line. So basically how this works is you have CRISPR-Cas9, you have the Cas9 nuclease, and you introduce that into your target cell line, and you also include a guide RNA, um, which specifically targets the Cas9 nuclease to a particular spot in the genome. Um, now, this is uh, doubly great because it's both extremely specific and extremely flexible. You can swap out the guide RNA for any other sequence you want to target the Cas9 to any other point in the genome that you want. Now, once Cas9 has targeted a specific genomic lo locus um, from the guide RNA, it makes a double-stranded break through both strands of the DNA, um, which the cell then detects as DNA damage. Now, this is the part of CRISPR-Cas9 that's slightly less, less precise because the cell has two mechanisms by which it can fix this double-stranded break. On the left, you can see that the cell can repair this double-stranded break through this error-prone process called non-homologous injoining, where it kind of just takes the two broken ends of the DNA and uh, shoves them back together. Usually, you get small insertions, deletions, just little mutations at this error-prone repair site. Um, and on the other hand, on the right, you can get precise repair through homology-directed repair. And in this mechanism, the cell uses a nearby intact copy of the gene. Um, in our case, we're hoping that it uses the provided donor sequence homologous to the gene, but including the sequence that we want to edit into the genome as the repair template. So that in the end, what you get out is a precisely repaired gene with no changes other than the ones that you've intended. Okay, so that's how CRISPR-Cas9 works. Now we'll talk about the applications of this technology in drug discovery. CRISPR can be used in functional screening to identify genes or sets of genes involved in the cellular response to small molecule inhibitors, or to identify new disease targets for small molecule inhibitors. This is done either through genome-wide knockout screens, um, which is something that was not at all possible before CRISPR-Cas9, or through genome-wide inhibition or activation screens using CRISPR-I. CRISPR can also be used to generate new transgenic animal models of human disease cheaper and more quickly than the way that we were previously doing it. There are three levels you can do this with. Um, with an animal model, you can edit the embryonic stem cells and make an entire transgenic animal with CRISPR or you can introduce CRISPR-Cas9 into an animal that's already developed for tissue or developmental stage-specific gene editing. Or you can have an unmodified animal that you use as a xenograft host for CRISPR-Cas9 engineered disease model cells or tissues. All three of these methods are ways CRISPR can be used to generate animal models for drug discovery, screening, and validation. But the application of CRISPR-Cas9 that we're going to be talking about today is its use for the generation of precision-engineered cell-based models of disease and then the use of these model cells in drug discovery and validation. How these engineered cell models can help us better understand the functional connection between specific gene mutations and the resulting disease state. Okay, so here in ATCC, we're particularly well positioned to take advantage of CRISPR technology for the generation of new cell-based models of disease. We have extensive experience and capability in both cell biology and molecular biology. Historically, we're known for a role in cell banking and cell line authentication, so we have an extensive library of cell lines available for modification by CRISPR-Cas9. We have systems already in place for single cell cloning and genotype phenotype validation that we can apply to the modification of extant cell lines. We also have deep, deep expertise in molecular biology that we use for CRISPR reagent design and validation, and we have capabilities with qPCR, digital droplet PCR, and sequencing to analyze edited lines, and we've developed our own toolbox of expression vectors for different CRISPR genome engineering applications. 
We use all these capabilities together with our extensive library of validated cell lines to generate and fully characterize new cell-based models of human disease. Now I'm going to talk specifically about what we're doing with cell-based models of acquired drug resistance. Acquired drug resistance develops usually in a clinical setting where a patient is given a drug, but then initially it responds well to the drug, um, but then the drug stops working over time because the resistance develops. Now, say you wanted to study how that resistance develops and maybe find a new drug or treatment method that can overcome this acquired drug resistance. How would you do that? There are several ways you can go about this. Um, the most obvious way of studying this is to take a patient in a clinical setting um, that has already developed resistance to your chemotherapeutic drug and isolate uh, some cells from that patient and then in use of those cells for drug screening. Um, the advantages of this is that the cells are relatively easy to isolate. It's not very time intensive. You already have them. They're already resistant. Um, and then, the, and then the, the drawbacks of this, though, is that the new cell line is totally uncharacterized initially. Um, it's most likely a heterogeneous mixture of cells, and there's no available control cell line unless you've gone back in time and taken a sample from this patient before they became resistant to the drug, and this is very rarely done. So uh, um, in the middle, uh, this is an example of the second way that we have the making cell-based models of acquired drug resistance. Um, basically, what you do is you take a known cancer cell line um, that's sensitive to a drug and you apply increasing concentrations of that drug over time. Um, and then the cells slowly develop resistance to that drug as the selective pressure is applied. The disadvantage of this is that it can take up to 18 months for um, the cells to become fully resistant to your drug. Um, and then also long-term drug pressure uh, can lead to the accumulation of spurious mutations that are unrelated to the drug resistance phenotype they are interested in. And this accumulation of spurious mutations makes the parental line that you started with 18 months ago kind of a bad control cell line. Um, any results you get from this resistant line, sometimes you can't really tell if it's due to the resistance or due to some other spurious mutation. And again, like the isolation of resistant cells from clinical samples, um, you really get a heterogeneous mixture of, of cellular genotypes in your pooled population. And in addition to that, constant drug pressure is required to maintain the drug resistance phenotype. If you just culture these cells in the absence of drug going forward, very slowly over time, they'll start to lose that drug resistance phenotype, unfortunately. However, on the right, we're gonna talk about CRISPR-Cas9 genome engineering of uh, models of acquired drug resistance. And this is by far the best way to do this. Um, it's, it's, uh, advantages are that it's precise. You make one genome edit um, and you get drug resistance from that. You get a homogeneous cell population because you do single cell cloning. So every cell in your population is, has the same genotype. Um, because you had a parental cell line that you did a precision genome edit on, the parental line uh, is a very good positive control um, for drug resistance in this case. And you don't need any type of selective pressure applied during routine cell culture in order to maintain the drug resistance phenotype because it's introduced directly into the genome and it's stable. Um, also, the mechanism of drug resistance is known because it's all due to the point mutation that you introduce, um, and the results are highly reproducible. Okay, now we're going to talk about BRAF mutations specifically in melanoma. So, BRAF is a serine threonine protein kinase involved in the RASRAF MEC-MAP kinase pathway um, that's diagrammed over here on the left. And basically, this pathway regulates cell proliferation and survival, and increased signaling down this pathway leads to increased cell survival and proliferation. And in cancer, this can go very badly because um, mutations in this pathway, in this case um, to BRAF, cause an aberrantly uh, large amount of signaling down the pathway, driving tumor formation and growth. In the case of melanoma, about 50% of the time, you find that the cancer is being driven by an activating mutation in BRAF. Um, it's downstream of RAS and upstream of MEC in this signaling, signaling pathway. And in fact, if you sequence BRAF-driven melanomas, this one specific mutation is found over and over again. It's BRAF V600E, so this is a very common 
driving mutation in melanomas. Um, now, fortunately, with these BRAF driven melanomas, um, we have BRAF inhibitors that we can give people, um, such as dibrafenib and vemurafenib. These drugs have been on the market for several years now. And unfortunately, as you can see over here on the right, um, in this unfortunate circumstance, uh, when a BRAF inhibitor is administered, uh, it's initially very, very effective. You get, um, you know, your tumors shrink and you get a decrease in your melanoma um, for a few months. But then after several months, you get uh, resistance to this BRAF inhibitor that develops and the cancer comes roaring back. You get tumor regrowth. So what's causing this? Why is this happening? Um, with acquired BRAF inhibitor resistance in melanoma, frequently what we see is the accumulation of secondary activating mutations to other proteins in this ras raf map kinase pathway. The ones we're going to be talking about today are specifically secondary mutations in RAS proteins, which operates upstream of BRAF, and in MEK proteins, which operate downstream of BRAF in this pathway. So um, the accumulation of these secondary mutations um, in other proteins in the pathway allows the cancer to bypass BRAF inhibition um, by going around or getting under BRAF in the signaling pathway and allowing signaling to continue down the pathway via other mechanisms, even though BRAF is inhibited. Um, these secondary mutations um, result in the progression of the cancer and poor clinical outcomes. Um, unfortunately, currently available chemotherapeutics and treatment regimens don't adequately address this issue of BRAF inhibitor resistant melanoma and the development of new drugs and combination therapies for the treatment of these cancers is really hindered by the lack of well controlled, uh, physiologically relevant cell based models for the screening and validation of new drugs and therapies. Okay, now for the second part of the webinar, we'll talk about our drug resistant melanoma model in 375 cell lines and the different types of validation and quality control we've done on these lines. We'll go over the use of CRISPR-Cas9 to create our engineered isogenic melanoma model lines. We'll talk about the different cell lines we have in our uh, melanoma model cell kits. We'll go over the genome and transcript level sequence validation of our melanoma model lines, some of the off-target cutting and Cas9 integration screening that we do on these lines, and finally, the functional validation of the drug resistance phenotype in these model systems. We chose A375 malignant melanoma human cell line as the parental line for isogenic drug resistant melanoma models. A375 does carry the activating BRAF V600E mutation, and um, these cells are sensitive to BRAF inhibitors like dibrafenib and bimurafenib. Um, what we then do is we use CRISPR Cas9 to introduce specific point mutations conferring BRAF inhibitor resistance into the genome of A375 cells. And this on the right here is our basic workflow for doing this. First, we introduce Cas9 along with guide RNA targeting the gene of interest into the cell. At the same time, we introduce a sequence donor carrying the drug resistance point mutation, with the idea being that once Cas9 has made a cut to the target site, cellular DNA repair mechanisms, um, we use homology director repair to insert the provided donor sequence carrying the point mutation into the genome. After that's happened, we sort the cells into single clones. We let those clones grow up and then we do a primary screen um, by Sanger sequencing at the genomic target site to identify which clones have the desired point mutation. Um, once we get our positive clones, we do functional validation for drug resistant phenotype. And before we do cell banking, we do all of our standard quality control practices like testing for purity and sterility, species identification, post law viability validation. Then we bank our cells and we do target site genotyping for every distribution lot on all of our isogenic cell lines. So these are the cell lines we have right now in our drug resistant isogenic melanoma model system. Um, on the top, of course, we have the parental A375 cell line, uh, which carries the BRAF V600E mutation and is sensitive to BRAF inhibitors. Um, this should be included as a control in any experiment or screen which uses these isogenic melanoma models. Our first isogenic melanoma model line is here our KRAS G13D mutant. RAS again acts upstream of BRAF and activating RAS mutations such as KRAS G13D 
allow for map kinase pathway activation even in the presence of BRAF inhibitors. We see significant BRAF inhibitor resistance in this cell line. Our next melanoma model line is another RAS mutant. It's our NRAS Q61K estogenic line, which similar to the KRAS line, has an activating RAS mutation that drives map kinase signaling even in the presence of BRAF inhibitors. Our third melanoma model line is our MEC1 mutant A375 line, this is our newest line. Uh, this line carries a homozygous MEC1 Q56P mutation um, that, in addition to uh, conferring BRAF inhibitor resistance, it also confers resistance to MEC inhibitors, and we'll go more into that later. All three of these isogenic lines are available now, and the drug resistance phenotypes have been validated in both 2D and 3D tissue culture. We'll get into the 3D functional validation in the next section of this talk. Okay, so these are the three lines we have right now in our isogenic melanoma model system. Um, this is just the, the first type of screening that we do is a uh, Sanger sequence of the target genome sequence. So for the KRAS D13D, you can see that we've had an A to G heterozygous mutation in both the genome and the transcript. For the NRAS line, we've had um, a, an A to C heterozygous mutation um, in both the genome and the transcript. And for the MEC1 mutant A375 line, we've had a homozygous A to C mutation at this position in both the target and the transcript locus. Okay, so the next type of screening that we do on all of our isogenic lines is um, one off-target Cas9 cutting screening and Cas9 CMV integration. So these are the two primary ways that residual effects of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing can be left behind in your line once you're done with your genome edited. So um, basically what happens is Cas9 cut at target target sites that are not identical but very similar to that of matching the guide RNA. And um, it can make double-stranded DNA breaks at these off-target sites, and then when these are repaired via the um, non-homologous injoining error-prone repair mechanism, you can get small insertions and deletions at this off-target cutting site. And if this is in an exon intron junction or in an exon of another gene or a promoter, um, you can really affect the cellular biofunction with this, these off-target cuts. So we screen all of our isogenic cell lines at these off-target sites. So here we've used computational tools to identify the top 10 most likely off-target cut sites for one of our cutters, in this case, the MEC1 mutant A375 isogenic line. And we just PCR amplify up all of those off-target sites and just Sanger sequence them and make sure they match the deposited sequence and the unedited A375 genomic sequence. And you can see this 10 out of 10 passed in this case in the MEC1 mutant genomic line. Now on the right, you can see we're doing our um, Cas9 integration and CMV integration screening. Um, what happens here is when the Cas9 um, is introduced on the plasmid, um, that's supposed to be transiently introduced into the cell and it's not supposed to be there in the final product. But what can happen, unfortunately, sometimes is you can get integration of the plasmid into the genome, which can lead to constitutive expression of Cas9 in your cell. Um, and this is something we really don't want. If you have constitutive Cas9 expression, you can get even more off-target cutting even after you're done doing your genome edit. So we screen all of our clones for both Cas9 and CMV, which is the promoter used on our vector construct in space, so that we make sure we have no um, aberrant Cas9 expression in any of our isogenic cell lines. Okay, now we're getting on to the 2D functional validation of these cell lines. Okay. We're, we really see the utility of having the parental unmodified A375 line as a non control. Over here on the bottom, the darker cell line is the unmodified A375 cell line. And on these dose response curves for the BRAF uh, inhibitors, Dibrafenib and Bemirafenib, you can see that all three of the isogenic lines, KRAS, NRAS, and MEC1 isogenic lines, are resistant to both Dibrafenib and Bemirafenib when compared to the parental A375 cell line. Now, in addition to validating the BRAF inhibitor resistance phenotypes in our isogenic melanoma models, we also check to make sure that they don't have a differential response to non-BRAF-specific chemotherapeutics. In this case, 
etalpicide, and doxorubicin. This experiment is just to make sure that the isogenic lines aren't, for some odd reason, just more robust or hardier or harder to kill by any type of drug than the parental A375 line. Um, we would expect no differential response in the parental versus the isogenic lines with, with these non-BRAF related drugs. And indeed, what we see is sort of the same amount of resistance, i.e. not very much, with etalbicide and doxorubicin. Um, in these experiments. Now, because the MEK1 isogenic melanoma model line is resistant to both MEK and BRAF inhibitors, we can do one more layer of functional validation. Um, so the, we can do this MEK inhibitor um, validation as well. So this is two commercially available MEK inhibitors, um, benimitinib, also known as MEK162, and trametinib. Um, so again, we have the parental A375 cell line on the bottom and in gold, the MEK1 mutant showing significant resistance to these MEK1 inhib inhibitors. Okay, um, so now we're going to talk about combination inhibitor treatment in MEK1 mutant A375 cells. So um, on the left is a... Is a this schematic diagram of the MAP kinase pathway again, and you can see MEK where it's located downstream of BRAF. And we can see that in the MEK1 isogenic line, we have both the activating BRAF V600E mutation and the activating MEK1 Q56 mutation. Um, and in this situation, what we're trying to do is inhibit both upstream and downstream of this pathway. So if we inhibit both of these proteins at the same time, um, we can actually get what's called synergistic inhibition because these proteins are in the same pathway. If you inhibit the upstream and the downstream members, um, you can get more inhibition than you would get using either drug alone. So in this situation, if we give uh, the cells a half dose of BRAF inhibitor and a half dose of MEK inhibitor, you can get more inhibition than you would get with a full dose of either alone. Um, and this is really important because it can be one of the ways of addressing drug-resistant melanoma um, while using lower doses for reduced side effects and hopefully yielding improved clinical outcomes. So here's our combination drug treatment data for the MEK1 isogenic line. On the left is the dose-response curve using the BRAF inhibitor dibrafenib. And like before, we see significant drug resistance in the MEK1 isogenic line. On the right is the dose response curve for the MEK inhibitor trametinib, and again, very resistant. MEK1, um, the MEK1 curve is far to the right of, of the parental line, so it's, it's quite resistant at this point. Now in the middle, this is the interesting part, um, we've treated at each dose point, we've treated the cells with a half dose of the MEK inhibitor and a half dose of the BRAF inhibitor, and you can see just by this arrow how close the MEK1 dose response curve is to the parental line. Um, it's much less resistant to this combination mech uh, drug treatment than either alone. And again, this is half a dose of each, so it's not more drug than before. We're using the same amount of drug, and by using a combination rather than the drug alone, um, the cells are being killed. They're more sensitive to this combination therapy, and this is a good thing. Okay, so now we go even further. This is some molecular data exploring um, the single and combination drug resistance phenotypes we see in the MEK1 isogenic melanoma model line. So uh, this immunoblotting data is tracking signaling down the RASBRAF MAP kinase pathway, both with and without drug treatment in the parental A375 and the MEK1 isogenic line. So down the right side, you can see uh, we've blotted against MEK, ERK and AKT, as well as GAF-DH for the loading control. And we've also blotted against the phosphorylated versions of those proteins. So in this situation, phosphorylation of these MAP kinase pathway proteins indicates increased pathway signaling and a lack of phosphorylation or a, a lack of detecting a band of, uh, in the phosphorylated protein lane indicates that um, the drug has been effective in the pathway signaling has been inhibited at that point. Um, and then along the top, um, you can see that I've treated A375 unmodified parental cells or, or MEK1 isogenic resistant cells with either the BRAF inhibitor 
a MEK inhibitor. Doxorubicin, our nonspecific drug again, or nothing as a control. Um, or, and right in the middle, we have a combination of MEK and BRAF inhibitor, in this case, dabrafenib and trametinib. Now, if you take a look specifically in the correlation of ERK12, PERK12 lane, um, so again, phosphorylation indicates increased signaling, and lack of phosphorylation indicates in inhibition and drug response. So uh, in, in all these cases of BRAF inhibitor and MEK inhibitor treatment and the combination, you see uh, much more phosphorylation of ERK coming through in the MEK1 antigenic, which indicates that the cell line is resistant to these drugs. Whereas in the parental E375 line, you have no phosphorylation of ERK, indicating that these drugs have been effective at inhibiting signal pathway. Um, so we get sort of the same amount of resistance in the MEK inhibitor and the BRAF inhibitor in the MEK1 cell line. But interestingly, if you look at the combo, um, BRAF inhibitor, MEK inhibitor lane, you get very little phosphorylation of ERK, indicating that uh, the pathway has been inhibited in this situation, which really reflects our, our dose response curve data showing that the cells have uh, much less viability with the combination treatments than they do with each one alone. So this is really just um, some really solid molecular validation of what's going on in this pathway in our isogenic cell line. Okay, now for the third part of the webinar, we'll talk about our uh, melanoma model 2D, 3D tissue culture system. Um, first, we'll go over the different types of model systems for drug screening and validation that are available, then we'll introduce our 2D, 3D melanoma model system. We'll talk about 3D spheroid formation in these cell lines, functional validation of the drug resistance phenotype in a 3D tissue culture system, and uh, finally, how we do automated analysis of drug response in these 3D tissue culture systems. So when it comes to model systems for drug screening and validation, there are three main options. You can have a cell-based model that you use in a 2D tissue culture system. Um, there are several benefits of this approach. Um, first, it's, you can use a human cell line, um, which is good. It's low cost and it's not time intensive. The assay readout is usually simple and automated. However, this approach um, usually has the lowest system complexity and tends to give you a high rate of failure of your compounds in the at the clinical trial level. The next step up um, in model systems is uh, to use a cell-based model system in a 3D tissue culture system. This is, again, good because you can use a human cell line. There's more system complexity, right? The spheroid has inside, it has outside. Um, there are cell-cell contacts going on. Things are happening. Um, and this is at only slightly increased uh, time and cost compared to using a 2D cell model. And um, it's, it's more complicated uh, assay readout, but it, it, can st it can still be automated. And um, the, the 3D tissue culture system gives you, um, has the potential to give you a lower clinical trial failure rate um, in comparison to using a 2D tissue culture model. And finally, there are animal models. Animal models obviously aren't a human system, but they do have very high system complexity, um, which is a benefit, and they usually give the lowest clinical failure rate of lead compounds. On the other hand, animal models are extremely time and cost intensive, um, so it's definitely not a place you want to start out. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is allow researchers, experiments, experimenters, and scientists to seamlessly move from a 2D to a 3D tissue culture system um, sort of at will, so that when it's time to move to an animal model or a clinical trial, you can really be sure that you've exhausted all your options of screening um, that you can using a, a, using a cell-based model. Okay, so these are some bright field images of our 2D, 3D isogenic melanoma model cell system. On top, you have all four A375 lines grown in 2D tissue culture unmodified A375, KRES, INRES, and MEK1 isogenic. They all look basically the same. Um, then across the bottom, we have 3D spheroids grown from each cell line. And this is very easy to do. We simply feed 500 of each cell type in a spheroid microplate and give them seven days to grow, and they end up about this size. Um, all of them look basically the same, except for A375 KRES mutant isogenic. Um, this cell line um, very consistently and regularly forms much more compact spheroids um, 
So there are actually about the same number of cells in each of these spheroids along the bottom row. It's just that the KRAS ones are much more densely compacted um, than the other three. And um, this is not a problem for us in terms of screening of drug response. And I'll show you how we do that later. Okay, so these are some more bright field images um, just showing the sort of seven day time course of how these spheroids form and grow. Um, again, all we do is we see 500 of each cell type in a spheroid microplate. Um, and then over the course of the first couple of days, the cells come together and they condense to form the nucleus of the spheroid. Um, and then over the next several days, the spheroid grows. Um, by the time you get to day seven, this is about what size they are. And this is about at what time we would be analyzing the drug response to these cell lines. Um, this is how the cell lines grow and form in the absence of any type of drug. So this is just baseline for everything you're gonna see going forward. Okay, so this is the basic workflow that I use um, for the 3D functional validation and drug screening of the melanoma model line. Um, first, like I mentioned, uh, we seed A375 cells, either um, unmodified parental or the antigenic melanoma model, into a spheroid microplate. Um, we then give those three days to grow, uh, and then we add whatever drug treatment we're going to be doing, as well as control, and then we wait another three days. At this point, you have a six-day spheroid that's been treated with drug, treated with drug for three days. Um, and then what we do is we actually just live stain these spheroids with calcium green, which is um, a live cell metabolic marker and a live cell nuclear marker. So by using this live staining method, we're really skipping a lot of fuss. So there's no fixation, there's no washing step, there's no stopping, there's no removing of the media. You just add these small molecule dyes um, and then stain that for 90 minutes and then scan, it's very simple. Um, at the end of 90 minutes, we um, use a confocal high content imager to automatically analyze these spheroids. So what it does is it takes a Z-stack of each spheroid and then generates a Z-stack projection to get this nice composite image of each spheroid. Um, it then takes a look in the blue channel and does some analysis to identify and outline segment each of the nuclei present in the spheroid, and then it looks at the green channel and it delineates the boundary of the spheroid itself, and then it's able to calculate the amount of green calcium staining within that border. So this is an example of the type of raw data that we would get out um, from the high content imager. So on the left, we have unmodified parental A375 cells. And on the right, we have our in red mutant A375 isogenic cells, which are resistant to BRAF inhibitors. And then down the right side, and you see on the top, we have um, no drug treatment. So that's our negative control. Um, we have debrafinib treatment, femorafinib treatment, and again, doxorubes and our nonspecific chemotherapeutic agent. So those are the raw images. Um, and then the high content imager will automatically Again, as I said before, look in the blue channel, count the nuclei, look in the green channel, calculate the spheroid size and green staining intensity, top you out a raw data table, which you can then um, normalize to the undrugged condition. So in this case, we're dividing everything by the undrugged condition. And that's the way we get around our issue of like, if the cell line grows faster than that cell line, the spheroid is a different density than that spheroid. We just compare everything to the undrugged condition and just get a percent change. That way we don't have to deal with any of that. Um, we do do a whole bunch of replicates for this. We average the replicates and then that'll give you the final data set. Okay, so this is some examples of um, the type of automated um, steroid drug response data that we can get with these isogenic A375 cell lines. So we have unmodified A375 on the left, in res uh, mutant isogenic in the middle, and our nicely brown compacted KRAS mutant isogenic steroid on the right. And we've treated them with no drug, dubrafenib or vimorafenib. And the parameters that we're looking at here are average steroid size and average steroid calcium staining. So that's how big is the spirit in the green channel and how much green is there? Um, and as you can see, the in-res and the k-res spheroids both have significant resistance 
uh, to dibrafenib and femorafenib, and a very similar thing if you look at the average calcium staining. Okay, so this is a similar type of thing, but in the MEK1 model line. Um, in this case, we've used both BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors. Um, on the top is the parental A375 line. On the bottom is the MEK1 isogenic. You can see just from the size of the spheroids, there's a big difference. Um, the wild type ones are, are very small and dense and compacted, whereas the uh, resistant MEK1 mutant spheroids are looser and larger and more healthy looking. Um, and in this case, uh, I've graphed instead average spheroid nuclei count, um, which is detected in the blue channel. And this data very much reflects what we see in the images in that the MEK1 line is significantly resistant to dibrafenib, bemorafenib, trematinib, and MEK162, the same as it is in 2D tissue culture system. So very good data. Okay, so a key points of this webinar were um, CRISPR-Cas9, engineering of cell-based models for drug discovery, the applications in drug discovery, our genome editing platform here at ATCC, cell-based models of acquired drug resistance and mechanisms of acquired inhibitor resistance. Specifically, we talked about BRAF inhibitor resistance in melanoma. And then we talked about um, how we use CRISPR-Cas9 to create isogenic drug-resistant melanoma model cell lines and our 2D, 3D isogenic melanoma model system. Then we went into some genome and transcript level validation of our melanoma model lines off-target cut Cas9 integration of melanoma model lines, and functional validation in a 2D tissue culture system. And then finally, we talked about um, different types of model systems for drug screening and validation, 3D spheroid formation in our melanoma model lines, 3D tissue culture drug-resistant model functional validation, and automated drug response screening using a high-content imager. All right, so in conclusion, Clinically relevant cancer cell models are critical, both for studies of molecular and cellular mechanisms of tumor genesis and for the design and screening of novel cancer therapeutics. With new genome editing tools such as CRISPR-Cas9, ATCC can now use its extensive cell banking resources to generate novel isogenic disease model cell lines. We've engineered isogenic cell lines with mutations in key oncogenes that are ideally suited for the identification of novel personalized treatment regimens. Our parental lines are carefully selected for disease and drug target relevance. Our parental line is well characterized and together with CRISPR-Cas9 isogenic lines um, make an excellent disease model system. Precisely added isogenic lines have been th thoroughly validated at the genomic, transcript, protein, and cellular biofunctional levels. Additional biofunctional characterization with specific in inhibitors has been performed for isogenic melanoma model lines in both 2D and 3D tissue culture. Um, when used together with authenticated parental lines, CRISPR-Cas9 edited isogenic melanoma model lines provide useful in vitro models for both basic and translational research. And now if you want to hear more of our webinars, um, please go to atcc.org slash webinars. Um, if you want to learn more about our isogenic lines, please go to atcc.org slash isogenics. And if you want to learn more about our cancer research and cancer cell lines here at ATCC, please visit atcc.org slash cancer. And I will now take questions. Thank you, Liz. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session. Please use the chat function available for the webinar program to submit your questions. The session will be archived along with the recorded webinar presentation on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. Okay, and for our first question, how can we reduce the number of off targets if there is a specific guide RNA that you need to use? All right, so that's a very good question. Um, obviously, the best way to minimize off-target effects when doing any type of CRISPR-Cas9 genome edit would be to choose a guide that doesn't have a lot of high-impact off-target effects. But I understand um, if you have a very specific guide that you do need to use, um, what you can do is you can down titrate the amount of Cas9 that you're using. Um, so just trying to minimize the amount of Cas9 that's expressed in your target cell line and also the duration 
over which uh, Cas9 is expressed in that cell line. And then after that, um, there's really not much you can do except um, just make a lot of clones and screen for your off targets to select clones that don't have off target mutations interrupting genes of interest. Okay. Um the, the next question, so uh, I'm paraphrasing this if it came in, so forgive me if it doesn't sound exactly like how it was sent, but how stable is the drug resistance phenotype over time? And then the a second part of this question is, do you need to check it before you use it, presumably if you do this yourself? Okay. Um Right, so the, the phenotype of drug resistance in these cell lines is very stable over time because the point mutations have been introduced into the genome. So those aren't going to revert back to a non-resistant phenotype at high cell passages. And then um, for our, our functionally validated isogenic cell lines, we've already done all of the drug resistance phenotype genotype screening. And that information is available on our website um, on the pages um, for those cell lines. So no, you don't have to do any type of, of screening or functional validation yourself once you receive our isogenic cell lines. Great, great answer. Now, what type of transfection do you use? Ah, um, so to introduce our CRISPR-Cas9 reagents into the cell, um, it really depends on what cell line you're using. Um, for our isogenic lines, we've used um, Lipid-based transfection, we've used several different types of electroporation, we've done a whole lot of sort of optimization of that um, issue. But for the A375 cell line specifically, we used a lipid-based transfection method. Okay, uh, our next question is, have you tried these cell lines as xenografts to test their resistance? Ah, okay. Um, so, so that's a good question. Um, A375 cells have been used extensively as xenograft models before, um, and uh, we're actually in the process of developing um, for A375 unmodified, um, for A375 inres isogenic and kres isogenic. We are developing a luciferase tagged um, reporter cell line um, derived from those cell lines. For specifically for use as xenograft models. So those will be available soon. Now, do you see any difference in drug response between isogenic melanoma models in 2D versus 3D tissue culture? Um, yes, actually we do. That's really interesting. Um, in, in 3D tissue culture, we find that the spheroids are actually more sensitive to the specific BRAF and MEK inhibitors than the same cells in 2D tissue culture. Um, but on the other hand, using the nonspecific chemotherapeutics like doxorubicin, in 3D tissue culture, the cells are much more resistant to those. So we can definitely see a differential effect on whether or not we're using a specific versus a nonspecific um, chemotherapeutic on these cell lines. So definitely um, doing screenings in both 2D and 3D tissue culture is important. Okay, and this is sort of a follow-up maybe to that. Uh, do you see any difference in drug response between the homozygous and heterozygous mutation melanoma model cell lines? So yes and no. Um, in the clinical setting, when we find these drug resistance mutations, the vast majority of the time, it's heterozygous. You don't find a lot of homozygous point mutations for drug resistance in clinical samples. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you have a homozygous version of the same mutation, um, it is slightly more drug resistant, but it's not like twice as drug resistant. So, and we do screen all of our uh, isogenic drug resistant models biofunctionally, like so for drug response. So all three of our lines that we have released uh, are resistant to BRAF and MEK inhibitors to the degree that is seen in the clinical setting. Okay, and, and actually that kind of leads into our next question. Um, will you be releasing more um, BRAF inhibitor resistant melanoma models? So um, the, uh, this viewer is interested in RAS mutations other than KRAS G13D and NRAS Q61K. 
So we're not planning on releasing any more um, drug-resistant melanoma models um, in the next couple of years, but we do have a uh, CRISPR services team right now, um, and you can submit um, a request to them at atcc.org slash CRISPR um, for the specific mutation you want and in the specific cell line that you want, and they will be able to give you a quote and work with you on that. Okay. Um, here's a very specific question about um, culturing these cells. What type of plates do you use for spheroid formation? Ah, yes. Um, so we've tried many different types of commercially available um, spheroid microplates, um, including ultra-low attachment and hanging drop, um, and they all work um, perfectly fine. So just any of the commercially available um, spheroid formation plates. Oh. Uh, Here's one, uh, and, and I'm actually paraphrasing a couple of different questions that have come in, um, but what tools do you use for guide RNA design? Right, so, so for guide RNA design, um, we use tools such as crispr.mit.edu, or um, personally I really like Chop Chop version 2. Um, and we also use CRISPR, just any of those um, publicly available uh, Cas9 CRISPR design websites. Now, do you see any difference in the drug resistance phenotype uh, of those isogenic melanoma models at high passage versus low passage? Right, so again, the, um, the mutations that we introduce here are directly into the genome, and we haven't created these cell lines um, through selective drug pressure. So the, the genotype and the phenotype are both extremely stable over time. Um, I would say that um, the resistance phenotypes will are, are fine up to high passages high enough that, that you would want to sort of return to a lower passage um, anyway, just for basic cell culture practice reasons. Okay, um, this is a, a more general, I guess, almost philosophical question. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of the session, you mentioned that the CRISPR-Cas9 technique can be used for designing cell lines for disease-specific research. Yes. Uh, can this be applied outside the area of cancer? So could you use this um, for endothelial cells to study the susceptibility of glycosylation, or response to hypoglycemic medications? Sure, so um, using CRISPR-Cas9, um, you can make disease models for any disease where, where the disease phenotype relies on a specific known genotype. Um, these are genetic diseases that have alterations to a single gene um, where, where you know what's happening and you can just go in and make that edit. Um, CRISPR-Cas9, um, is a little less useful for studying sort of multifactorial diseases that have many different sort of subtle genetic underpinnings. Um, something I mentioned earlier in the talk that you can do for the more complex sort of diseases is um, a CRISPR I um, or sort of screen or knockdown or an enhancement expression screen um, to sort of determine which genes uh, are impacting your disease phenotype. But basically, any any disease with a known genotype can be easily studied using CRISPR-Cas9. Okay, well, at this time, we will conclude our Q&A session. I'd like to thank our speaker for the excellent presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar presentation. Any questions that were not answered this afternoon will be answered and posted with the video at www.atcc.org. Thank you again and have a great day.